but w welcome everybody. Uh, and this group is all over 18. We can talk about the birds and the bees, <laughs> as well as the butterflies and other bug, good bugs and pollinators, because that's really uh, a lot of what this is about. We, we really like having birds and butterflies around because they're pretty. They look good. But they also are important for pollination, as are bees. And um, without these pollinators, we wouldn't be able to propagate our plants. So attracting them to our gardens is, is a good thing for the gardens as well as for our eye candy that they provide. And I will say I'm representing um, four organizations, I think, tonight. Uh, we've got the library, of course, uh, the Master Gardeners, the Allenberg Club, and also um, the East Long Meadow Garden Club. And I have some applications on the back table there if anyone is interested in joining or learning more about the Garden Club. Um, we are looking for the members. It's the best bargain in town, and uh, it's really a lot of fun. So think about it. If you want to attract, let's start out with the birds. And if you want to attract birds to the garden, the first thing you need to ask yourself is what do birds want? And the things they want are places to hide, first of all, because birds are very small and very vulnerable to lots and lots of different predators. And also in the winter, they need places to stay warm. And so they need what we call shelter or cover, places to hide. They need water. Birds have to drink water, even in the winter time. And if you provide water, the birds will come. We'll talk a little more about how to do that. But especially in the winter time, if you can provide water with a very low wattage heater, the birds will come. They need food. Food is where we begin to get somewhat specialized. Different birds eat different things. And so you need to think about the kinds of birds you want to attract and what those birds eat if you're going to provide them with what they want. And finally, they need nesting places. And nesting places are the most specific thing about different bird species. Every species has its own nest requirements. But they fall into some general categories, and we'll talk about those as well. So these are the four things you need to provide if you want to have birds around all the time. And we'll talk about each one in a little bit of detail. When we talk about shelter, in the summer, any dense shrub will do. In the winter, you're looking at evergreens. And when you think of evergreens, don't just think about pine trees or firs. Think about things like holly, rhododendrons, things that keep their leaves all year long. Uh, the birds love the rhododendrons because they're very dense and hard for predators to get into. I tell people that when you're setting up your feeding or drinking areas, you want to have your feeding or drinking areas about six feet away from the nearest shelter, nearest cover of the birds. And there's two reasons for that. One is if you make it further away from that, it's harder for the birds to get to shelter when the hawk shows up. And if you make it closer than that, it's easier for the cat to hide under there and jump on the birds at the feeder. So six feet is a good compromise. Some really good species of uh, cover are arborvitae, yews, rhododendrons, even though they're not native, and junipers. One of the things that I'll be talking about as we go along throughout this whole thing is that where possible, if you want to attract wildlife, you want to plant with native species. And there's good reasons for that, and which we'll talk about as we go along. But first, let's talk about water. Water is fairly simple to provide. You can get a very elaborate bird bath if you want, or you can take a plant tray and fill it with water and put a rock in it so it doesn't blow around when the wind comes. Either way, the birds don't care. Remember, these birds, if they didn't have your, your bird bath, would be out there drinking out of mud puddles. So they're pretty flexible on what you provide for water. It is important, however, to try to keep these relatively clean. Uh, don't get obsessive about it, but clean them out maybe once a week because stuff accumulates in it and things start to 
leaves and stuff start to rot and birds do things into the water. And so you need to clean it out now and then just for sanitary reasons. For food, <clears throat> we talk about first ones are seed eaters. And these are the finches, the cardinals, the goldfinches. That's a dixisle, I think, on the, uh, on the sunflower. And of course, turkeys. Okay, and we have lots of turkeys in this town. Turkeys eat big things like acorns. Uh, goldfinches eat very small seeds like thistle. And cardinals eat almost anything you put out there for them. They're very voracious. So seed eaters are relatively easy to provide supplemental seed for, but also to provide plants for. When you think about seed eaters, you think about plants that produce lots of seeds. So sunflowers are great, zinnias are great. Any plant, that, usually plants of the composite family are the best because they produce the greatest amount of seed out there. If you want turkeys, oak trees are great. They love the acorns and they will come in, but they'll come in and eat almost anything. Um, and you've probably seen them around town at various places. Then we have the fruit eaters. These are the robins and the um, mockingbirds and the bluebirds. These birds, the, parent, the adult birds eat fruit. And so they really like things like crab apples and of course your um, blueberries and raspberries they love. Um, thank you for planting those. Sumac is good for these birds too. Uh, roses that produce rose hips are great because those rose hips stick around all winter. Likewise, winterberry holly is good because it provides uh, fruit all winter long, as long as the birds don't clean it out. So fruit eaters, you want to provide fruit trees of various kinds, okay? And uh, they can also be very decorative, obviously. In the winter, you can provide fruit also. You can put raisins out. You, if you want to attract these birds, you can put um, orange slices out, which will attract some of the birds. And then we have nectar eaters. These are the hummingbirds, which around here are the ruby throats, and the orioles. These birds do eat nectar, and they're looking for plants that provide lots of nectar. And, they, and one of the things about hummingbirds that you need to understand is they're very small and very light. And so it takes a lot of energy for them to go from one plant to the next. That's why they like things like thistles and other composites where they can come in and drink from a large number of flowers without going very far. Hummingbird feeders are very effective. They will attract hummingbirds. The thing to need to know about hummingbirds and hummingbird feeders, though, is that hummingbirds are used to drinking from flowers. And when you drink from a flower, you drain the, uh, the, sap, the uh, nectar out of the flower. So they'll drink from the flower for maybe a minute and then move on to the next flower. And they have a route that they follow. Usually takes them 15 to 20 minutes to do the circuit of the route. And then they come back to the feeder because they think the feeder is a flower. And if they stay there too long, they're going to drain it. So you can almost set your clock by your hummingbird because they will have a very well laid out route because they know where all the flowers are. And they'll go from one to the next to the next and then come back. So you'll never see a hummingbird hang around a feeder for like a long time. However, you can get a number of different hummingbirds coming uh, at, at different times. So they are relatively easy to see. Then we have the insect eaters. And these are the uh, swallows and the aptly named flycatchers and the woodpeckers, all of which are insect eaters. If you want to have these kinds of birds around, you need to be careful about using pesticides because if there are no bugs, they will not be there. The other birds that actually eat a lot of insects are the baby birds, the nestlings. They are not well enough developed to eat seeds or fruit or things like that. So they need to have something soft and that baby food is insects. And that's where we get back to the issue of planting with native species. Because our insects, most of them, 
have evolved over millennia to specialize on different trees or different plants. One of the things about insects is they tend to be very species specific on the plants that they feed on. That's why you have things like potato bugs that feed on potatoes, okay? Um, and tobacco hornworms that feed on tobacco and related plants like tomatoes and peppers. Typically, if we're trying, as a master gardener, if we're trying to diagnose what insect damage, what insect is causing the damage, the first thing you need to do is identify what is the plant. And once you do that, there's only a few insects that will attack a certain plant. The corollary to that is native plants will support a lot more insects per plant than an imported plant, a, a, an introduced plant. And so the parents, when they're feeding the young birds, if they're feeding off of native trees, let's say, can gather a lot more insects in a shorter period of time from a tree than if they're dealing with introduced trees. And if you're a parent and you're trying to feed these kids and you're feeding them maybe 10 times or 20 times a day, that's a lot of flying around you've got to do to gather all those bugs. And so it's very important to have native species in order to support the breeding of birds. And of course, birds don't live very long, so if they don't breed, they won't be around. So it's something to think about. And finally, we have the meat eaters, okay? Typically hawks, owls, and shrikes. These birds feed on other birds. They feed on small mammals. They do a good job with voles and rabbits and uh, any kind of small game they will go after. Some of them, special, like the Cooper's hawk and the Sharpshin, will specialize in birds. And they, those are the ones that will come down and take birds from the feeder. That's the plus side and the minus side of feeding birds. The plus side is you've got a whole bunch of birds there and the hawk's only going to take one of them. The minus side is the bird, the hawk looks down there and he sees a McDonald's. It's fast food. He can come in and grab a bird and fly off. So these birds are around and we have to tolerate them. There's some of them are, are actually quite beautiful. Um, we have bald eagles flying over. They eat fish. We don't have many shrikes in this area. They tend to be more northerly. There are owls around. There are at least three species of owl that we know of in the town. We have the screech owls, the eastern screech owls. They're little tiny ones. Uh, we have the great horned owls, which are the biggest ones. And then we have the barred owls, which live in the swamps. And uh, they are in town. They're just very secretive. You won't hear them or see them most of the time. What you will hear is about Four o'clock in the morning, you'll hear the great horned owls sometimes hooting if you're awake at that hour and stick your head outside. So these birds are around too. Typically, we don't feed these birds. They take care of themselves. And I've actually seen a red-tailed hawk come down and take a rabbit in my front yard. And it's kind of interesting because it was a young hawk, and the, uh, and the uh, rabbit was rather large, and they couldn't quite figure out what to do with it once it caught it because it was too big for the bird to, to carry away. But after a few flaps, he finally figured out how to do it and took it back. Nesting places, OK? I said each kind of bird nests in a different place. I'll just give you some examples. This could be a robin's nest in a fork of a tree. Robins like to nest in trees. Morning doves nest in trees. They have messier nests than robins do. A lot of birds will nest in trees. Goldfinches will. The interesting thing is you won't see the nest usually until the fall when all the leaves fall off because they, they deliberately try to camouflage the nest so predators can't find it. Then we have other birds that we call cavity nesters. And these are the birds that the bird boxes are useful for. These are things like swallows, particularly tree swallows and barn swallows. Um, bluebirds and wrens. They all, and, and chickadees and titmice are all what we call cavity nesters. And each of these birds likes to have a different size hole for the cavity. That's why if you're going to put up bird boxes, 
you need to do a little research and find out what size hole you need to use on the box to attract a certain kind of bird. Uh, if you don't do that, what's going to happen, if it's too big, you're going to get the uh, house sparrows nesting in there because they're bigger than a lot of these other birds. I'm, I'm part of a project called uh, Nest Watch, and I, the guy that was running the project out of UMass put a wren box in my backyard two years ago, and every year we have to replace the hole because the squirrels come in in the wintertime and not. So what, what we do is we put a plate over the hole with a new size hole in it. That way, it, when the wrens are in there, it's just the wrens. I did a very interesting job with that. They came in and monitored the box weekly because they could monitor the progress of the clutch. And they wired it for temperature and sound and they had cameras taking pictures of the animals going by and all that sort of stuff. And I think he got a PhD out of it, so that was good. <laughs> Others will nest on, on ledges. You can see this little nest here. This is a CB nest. Okay, on a downspout. And I've had a Phoebe's nest on, on my downspouts quite a few years ago. Uh, some swallows will also nest on downspouts. Actually, barn swallows nest on ledges, but inside of, of buildings. So if you see something like that on your house, that's, that's a bird's nest. And it's not going to damage the house. Leave it there until the end of the season. And if you don't like the way it looks, you can take it down. But um, Phoebes are actually fly catchers. They eat a lot of insects, and they are among the first migrants to come back in the spring. And I haven't heard one yet this year, but I expect to, within the next couple of weeks, hear them going, Phoebe, Phoebe, out in the backyard. And then we have ground nesters. And if you have woods or a, a, an area that is heavily shrubbed, you may have some ground nesters there. This is an oven bird. It's called an oven bird because the nest looks like an old-fashioned oven. And these birds will nest on the ground. You'll never see the nest unless you happen to step on it. So it's something to watch for if you're romping around your woods or any woods to be careful not to, uh, to look where you're stepping, shall we say. The other bird ground nester that's fairly common around here is the woodcock. Okay, the, the, the American woodcock, which at this time of year is doing its nuptial flights. Um, there's a good collection of them behind Meadowbrook School. But any place there's a field that's near water or near a swamp, they're likely to be there. And they also nest on the ground. The thing about ground nesters is typically they are very camouflaged. Okay, uh, if you don't, if the bird doesn't move, it'll look like a dead leaf. And then one, one time I remember I was walking uh, next to the area where I knew they were, and I almost stepped on one because uh, it was just, you couldn't see it at all. And it went poof, like that, right out in front of me. So nesting places, if you want to provide nesting places, you need to do a little research. There are books out there on the eggs and nests of birds. You can get them through the library, field guides, that will tell you more specifically what each and every bird needs. There's also a lot of information on the web on this. If you just Google on birdhouses, there's good information out there. Look for something from Audubon or Cornell that uh, will tell you how to build the boxes for the different size, sizes and types of birds. And it, it's interesting, cavity nesters go all the way up to wood ducks, which nest in cavities, and barn owls, which nest in cavities. Now, there are supposed to be barn owls around here. I have not seen one in the time that I've been birding around here. But they, we know they had them in Holyoke for quite a long time in the old factories that were living there. So they may be around, but they only come out at night, and they're very, very secretive. So it's hard to tell whether they're around or not. This is a chickadee box that I made out of some PVC pipe. It's just a piece of, actually, I think, three-inch pipe with uh, two end caps on it and a hole drilled in it. And wrens and chickadees will use these. Uh, I've got two in my backyard. I fill them up with cedar shavings from the pet store because the birds like to excavate a little bit. They don't just like an empty box. They'll excavate and then put their, um, their nest inside. 
And the nice thing about that is you know when there are shavings on the ground underneath it that you've got birds nesting there, or at least making nests. Um, so how do you design a landscape for the birds? Well, what you want is a diverse landscape. The last thing birds want is a lawn, okay? The only birds you're gonna get on lawns are the ones that are eating the grubs in the lawn. And that's some robins, some starlings, things like that. But birds really want a place where they can hide and a, a place that provides a lot of different vegetation for them to uh, get bugs off of and so on. So you want a, a landscape that's primarily based on native plants that fits in with your idea of landscaping, but that provides different habitats to different birds, okay? And, and do it diversely. Uh, include your, your feeders and your, your watering places in that, and make sure that the feeders are in places where you can see them, because you're putting them out in order to observe the birds. The thing about feeders is that feeders are just a supplement to the birds. Birds do not depend on bird feeders. If they did, every time somebody went on vacation, they'd be in deep, shit, deep trouble. <laughs> so, uh, excuse me, uh, slip of the tongue. But anyway, um, but they do like to congregate at the feeders and, so you can see them and you see what birds you have. Uh, so you want to make sure those are a place where you normally look out and, and can see what's going on there. There's there are a lot of good books out there on designing natural landscapes, and there are a lot of good native plants that you can use instead of uh, the, the more invasive or the, the uh, introduced plants that look, all, look just, just about as good. There are a lot of good cultivars out there these days, and it's something to look around for. So butterflies, that's the other main thing people like because they're so colorful. And I like to say butterflies are a lot like people. The young just want to hang around and eat. The adults just want to go to bars and drink and then mate. <laughs> and it's true. The, the, the caterpillars are nothing but eating machines. That's all they do. They are eating and eating and eating in order to get up enough fat in themselves that they can pupate. Because when they go into the cocoon, they've got to live without eating for a period of time and then transform themselves. And so they eat a lot. Caterpillars, however, are very, again like kids, very picky eaters. They will only eat certain plants. We call those host plants. And each species has a different set of host plants that they feed on. The one most people are familiar with is the monarch, which feeds on different species of milkweed. And there are a number of species of milkweed that they feed on, some of which are really spectacular flowers, and some of which are just kind of weeds. Uh, th there's a whole list of host plants. I'll go through some of them later on. Uh, but they are very specific. And so if you want to attract a particular type of butterfly, you need to have the kind of host plant that that butterfly uses. They like to nectar, and we'll talk about nectaring, uh, nectar flowers for them, and then they, they mate. And when they mate, they mate near the host plant so that they can lay the egg, the female can lay the eggs on the host plant. After they mate, they die fairly quickly. They do not let, let, hang around for a long period of time. The other thing about the butterflies is that they fly at different stages of the summer. There are some that fly in the spring, some that fly in June, July, and August. A book I recommend, it's, I think it's out of print now, but the libraries have it, you can get it maybe used on, on eBay or Amazon, is something called Butterflies Through Binoculars. And I'll pass this around. It's got great photographs at the back of all of the uh, eastern butterflies, the ones that are in, could be in this area. Uh, it also has, uh, for each species, it tells you what the major food plant is, the flight period in abundance, and how to identify it in the whole thing. Highly recommend it if you can find a copy of it. So what do they need? They need host plants, obviously. Uh, if they're going to breed, and they will hang around the host plants, so that's what the, they need. 
They need nectar plants, okay? They need plants that provide a lot of nectar in a small area because butterflies are very small and very light and it takes a lot of energy for them to fly around and if there's any wind, it's very difficult for them to fly. And they need water and also minerals. Uh, I remember being up in the Adirondacks a few years ago and stopped the car and got out and there was a mud puddle that was covered, literally covered, with yellow sw uh, swallowtails, yellow, eastern yellow swallowtail butterflies. And they were all drinking the water, okay? And part of that was because there were salts in the water and they need minerals, just like we do, okay? They can't survive necessarily on nectar alone. But they also need water, just plain water as well. So host plants. We know monarchs like milkweeds of most varieties. There's a great one out there called butterfly weed, which is a brilliant orange, very dense flower, and it looks great in the garden, and the monarchs love it too. But there are maybe half a dozen species of milkweed in this area. The Baltimore checker spot likes cleone, which is a flower that most of, many of you are familiar with. And Cleone also has, according to a friend of mine, the advantage of deterring deer from being in the garden. Okay, I know, don't know if it works or not, but it worked for her, so I'm not going to deny it. And then uh, tiger swallowtails, which are the big yellow ones that you see. Wild cherries and yellow birch. Birch keeps getting covered up here. I've got to fix that slide. But wild cherry especially, I've got lots of wild cherry in my yard, and I do get a lot of tiger swallowtails floating around. They're big and beautiful. Spicebush swallowtail, which is black, uh, feasts on spicebush, uh, spice which is lind Lindera benzoin, which grows naturally in this area. Okay, I, I had three plants in my backyard that were planted by, I guess, the birds. Uh, they eventually all die, but I'm expecting some more of them to come back. Uh, it's, got, it's a beautiful bush that blooms very early in the spring and produces berries as well, which the birds love. And my favorite name, the Great Spangled Fritillary, which looks kind of like a monarch, but if you look carefully, it's not. Uh, it host plant is violets in the older species which means pansies, johnny jump ups, and the dozen or so varieties of violet that grow naturally in this area. Yeah? When you say host plant, is that where it's going to lay eggs? It's where it's going to lay its eggs, and that's the plant that the young of caterpillars are going to feed on. Okay, because the caterpillars, as soon as they come out of the egg, have to start feeding. If they're on the wrong plant, they'll die. Okay, so the, the parent, is very specific about where she lays her eggs so that when the young hatch, they've got the food supply right there, okay? That's why we call it a host plant. It's hosting the butterfly. Now we'll talk about nectar plants. And, and as I say, each species has its own host plant. You really have to look them up. Nobody memorizes all of them. Uh, you, you've got to dig into it a little bit. Nectar plants a lot of the best nectar plants are composites. And there's a reason for that. A composite is a flower that actually is a whole bunch of flowers in one seed, one head, okay? Like a sunflower, all that stuff in the middle, each seed represents a single flower. And so if you're a butterfly and you land on one of these things, you can, you can just walk around the flower and nectar from each of the little flowers. You don't have to fly from one flower to the next to get to, to, to another flower. And that conserves energy for the butterflies, which is a very, very important thing for them. So zinnias work really well, just as sunflowers do. But Leah, they call it butterfly bush for a reason, and it's because of those dense flower heads that the butterflies can land on and just walk over them and go from flower to flower without having to fly. Asclepsis butterfly weed, that's the, um, the milkweed, that, that bright orange thing there. I've grown that, it grows really well, and it's, it's a great perennial. Rebecca is good. Uh, again, it's a composite, it's got lots of uh, 
lots of flower, of, of flower heads within the one. Also, it grows in dense patches, which again is attractive to butterflies. Echinacea, purple coneflower, a lot of butterflies like that. And bee balm attracts, flower, attracts them really well. Yarrow, Achillea, again, a composite. Violets, they're a host plant, but they also are good nectar plants. Oregano, butterflies really like herbs. I've got an herb garden in front of my house, and in a warm day in July, it'll be swarming with butterflies. Usually the little ones, the skippers, the little tiny brown ones that are hard to identify. But they're butterflies too, and they like the herb plants for whatever reason. Okay, they're very good, good nectar plants for them. Another way to do provide nectar, and my wife just made me a present of this, is a butterfly feeder. Okay, these are plastic things, and you put similar to what you do for hummingbirds. Okay, you put a nectar inside of here, and they've got three ways of feeding them. They've got these little wicks which look like flowers, and they soak up the nectar. And butterflies with the short tongues can nectar from these things. There are also deep holes, which are harder to see here that the butterflies with the long tongues will go into to get to the nectar. And there are also little spikes here that you can put fruit on because they will come to fruit as well. Bananas, oranges, apples. So you put little pieces of fruit on here and that will attract them as well. The thing with these and with um, hummingbird feeders you need to remember is that they do attract ants as well. Now one way to deal with that, uh, companies, the same company that made this one, make little dishes that you can put above them and you fill them with water and that keeps the ants from getting onto it okay if you're going to put this on top of a pole what you do is you put vaseline on the pole and that also keeps the ants from getting up there but you, you'll get ants and you'll get flies and you'll get other insects coming to this as well and that's not necessarily a bad thing it just makes it a little icky to clean it out now and then and then water Okay, I, there are butterfly watering trials you can do. You can use something like any bird bath um, that you would use for a bird bath. The thing is, you have to have a rock in the middle of it that's just slightly higher than the water. And the reason for this is that butterflies have really short legs. And if they land in the water, they, they're going to drown, okay, because they, they get their wings wet. So they need something to stand on when they're drinking. And that's why we put a rock in there for them to land on. It also helps keep it from blowing, all, blowing around. Or you can just provide some mud puddles if that's what you want to do, okay? Because they will also come to that. Designing butterfly gardens. This, this is a little bit more specific than designing for the birds. As I said, butterflies are very light and they get blown around by the wind very easily. And so you, if you're going to design a butterfly garden, you want to make sure that it is sheltered, that there are either trees around the area or in this case there's a fence so that the wind isn't going to blow the butterflies away as soon as they land. Typically, good butterfly gardens are either a border or a circle. A circle or a border you want to design it so that it's just deep enough that you can reach in to deal with the plants, to take care of the plants. Not so big that you have to actually get into the beds to, to do something with them. So how long is your arm? You know, three feet maybe, two and a half feet. That should be the radius of the, the circle or the, the depth of the bed so you can get in there and take care of the stuff. They also like it to be densely planted. As I said, they put out a lot of energy to go from one place to the next. You really, the more densely you can plant the flowers, the happier the butterflies are gonna be. You also wanna design it so that you have flowering all during the butterfly season, which would be from May to September usually, so that there's something there all the time for the butterflies. And that's, that's something to think about. This is a picture from the Montreal Botanical Gardens uh, of a butterfly border that they had there. 
uh, and you can see how densely planted it is and that it is somewhat sheltered by the trees and by, by the fences. And then, of course, there are other good books. And there are a lot of them. Digger bees, which live in the ground, are important pollinators for a lot of plants. Ladybugs take care of aphids for us. Honeybees are pollinators and also produce honey. Mantises attack a lot of bu bad bugs. Dragonflies also eat a lot of mosquito larvae, and they're good things to have around. Uh, in fact, there's a companion book to the one I passed around called Dragonflies Through Binoculars. And again, there are a lot of varieties of dragonfly. You'd be surprised at how many. And you really have to study them to be able to tell the difference, because a lot of them look the same. And then there are parasitic wasps. And what these species do, they're really very tiny wasps. They don't bother us. But they will parasitize things like tomato hornworm larvae and basically lay their eggs on the caterpillars of those, of those species. The eggs will hatch and kill the hornworm and then you won't have the hornworm moth being produced later on. So these kinds of bugs do lots of good things. The thing about bugs is that, uh, and I can give you a long list of good bugs that are around there. I've got a friend who does a talk called There Are No Bad Bugs. And to a large extent, that's true, because even mosquitoes, OK, the bird, the swallows eat mosquitoes, the flycatchers eat mosquitoes, the bats eat mosquitoes. Um, everything has its niche, if you will, in, the, the, in nature. And so one of the important things to remember is that you need to be really careful about using pesticides, insecticides particularly, because insecticides usually don't specify good bug versus bad bug. They just take out all the bugs. And that's not a really good idea. So what, one of the things we teach in master gardening okay, is that you only treat for when you have a problem. Okay? If you've got an infestation of a certain kind of bug on a certain plant, then you might treat that plant. But you don't yard guard the whole thing, whole yard just because one plant has got a bug infection on it. And you try to look for the most benign way to deal with that, whether it's picking the bugs off uh, or treating it with, with water or some other way before you go for the heavy duty pesticide, okay? As I said, bugs are very specific in the plants, just like butterflies. Most bugs are very specific in the plants that they attack. And so if you have bugs on your potatoes and tomatoes and, and peppers, they're not going to bother your lettuces and carrots and other plants because they're the only certain plants that they will attack. So you want to make sure that you're not insecticiding everything in your garden because uh, there are a lot of good things out there that you want to have and you don't want to wipe them out. A really good book that I can recommend, and again, you can get this through the library, library loan, Attracting Beneficial Bugs to Your Garden by Jessica Wallison. And this is a, a whole book on beneficial bugs and a natural approach to, to pest control that uh, a different way of looking at insects in your garden. And I, I high, highly recommend it. Um, this one actually is in the East Long Meadow Public Library. I can see from the tag up there. So they do have a copy. And if, if that one's out, you can always interlibrary loan it. Um, they're very happy to do that for you. And, you know, as I said, butterflies are insects, and insecticides kill butterflies. So if you want butterflies, you really be careful about insecticides. Um, also, a word for the bees. I don't know how many of you realize this, but bees are really under siege right now. There's something called hive collapse going around. They're not really sure what causes it, but there's good evidence that insecticides are contributing to it. It's not exactly causing it, weakening the bees so that uh, they're more susceptible to viruses and other things. So the less pesticide we can use, the, the better off 
we all will be, and, and the bees will be also. And then there's one honorary bird, the bat. We do have bats around here. They are friendly. Not friendly, really. They, uh, they avoid us as much as possible. Um, the only time you have trouble with bats, really, is if you let them get in your, your attic. And the way to avoid that is to make sure you've got screens on all your vents so that they can't get in there. Uh, you'll see them at twilight flying around, if you look. They are eating insects. They fly at twilight. Most of them actually live in trees. They don't live in belfries or places like that, uh, where there are several species in the area, including the uh, little brown bat, the big brown bat, and a number of others. And you can, if you're really good, distinguish them uh, if you got binoculars. But the problem is they're flying when it's just getting dusk, and they fly very erratically and very fast. And so it's hard to get your binoculars on them. But um, I call them honorary birds because they do eat lots and lots and lots of insects. Some of them eat fruit, and they do pollinate. The ones that eat fruit pollinate uh, and other flowers and nectar sometimes do also do some pollination. So they're, they're good things to have around. They typically will avoid humans at all costs unless you're bothering them. So, my message is welcome birds and butterflies and other good bugs to your garden and enjoy them. And I'll be happy to take any questions at this point. <clears throat> what is the uh, benefit of just water and sugar as compared to some of these commercial nectar ingredients? The commercial ones add a little bit of protein to theirs, okay? But again, hummingbirds are not going to uh, exists solely off your hummingbird feeders. They have a route that involves lots of flowers as well as, as your feeders. So your feeders are kind of like uh, a little bit of, of um, not Gatorade, uh, but uh, soda pop, if you will, that they get along the way. Okay, it's a little bit of extra energy because of the sugar, but um, it's, it's not essential to them. It's more a way of our bringing them in so we can see them. And the nectar, by the way, for hummingbirds is different from the nectar strength that you use for butterflies. Butterflies like a much weaker uh, mixture, okay, more like 20 to 1 rather than, than 4 to 1, which is what you use for hummingbirds. So it's homemade better than the crates? It's not necessarily better, it's a lot cheaper. <laughs> you can buy a pound of sugar for a lot less than you can buy a pound of, 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 of nectar stuff. Uh, and, and for hummingbirds, it doesn't have to be red. You don't have to put red food coloring in, okay? The, the feeders have the red, usually, or some color like that, yeah. at the, the feeding point, and that's all they care about. Most nectars in plants are, are clear. They're not red, okay? That's just something that somebody came up with to make it look good. Okay. Anything else? What was the ratio 20 to 1? What's uh, the units on that? Um, I, I would have to check that to make sure, but I think it's, it's like 20. Four, is it? What? Is it for sugar, one and four? That's for hummingbirds. Yes. But for butterflies, it's more like one and 20. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's much is more than Gallons and teaspoon, or what? Um, I would, I, 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 I don't remember. equal I, units? I don't remember the formula, okay. but I, it, you can easily I'll find it. Yeah. 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 Uh, butterflies. Because they, they have different digestive systems, can't handle really um, intense amounts of sugar, and it can actually hurt them. So you gotta be careful about that. Anything else? Yeah. Um, are there good? What are good plants around here to feed bees when they first come out early? Because um, I I feel like I have plenty that they feed on a little bit later, maybe June, mid June, and beyond. But yeah. Is there are good things to have that bloom early when the bees first come out? Well, um, crocuses certainly, okay, that, that's, a, that's good. Um, clover, of course, is what they really, most of them re really prefer. Yeah. Dandelion. 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 Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's good. <laughs> and, and are there any bigger landscape type bushes and stuff that have well, early blooms? Early bloomers would be witch hazel, um, spice bush. Okay, Th those both bloom quite early. In fact, my, my witch hazel was blooming in February. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 
But typically, um, the thing about butterflies and bees also is they're not going to come out until the blooms are there. So I tell people, people ask me, when, when, are, the, when are the hummingbirds going to come back? When should I put my hummingbird feeders out? And I say, well, look at the trees. The hummingbirds aren't going to come here until there's something for them to eat. And so until the trees start blooming, the early blooming spring cherry blossoms like, uh, they're not going to show up because they know there's, there's nothing to eat. Uh, bees eat more than just pollen. Okay, and some of the bigger bees, for instance, do eat other things. So they may come out earlier than some of the, say, the honeybees. Again, they're not going to show up until such time, or come out of hibernation, until they know there's something to eat. So it's something to think about. Um, something I want to add, if you want to take pictures of butterflies, yes, I'll give you some hints. I have a friend who is a professional photographer, a nature photographer. And she was telling me the way she gets her butterfly pictures. And she says, this is what you do. You go out in the evening, after it's getting cool, and look for the butterflies underneath the flowers, on the stems of the plants. And mark where, where they, they are, because they're going to stay there all night long. Butterflies are cold-blooded, and they can't fly until they warm up in the morning. So you mark the plant. And then you come back early the next morning, okay, before the sun, just when the sun is starting to come up. And the butterfly is going to climb up on top of the flower and spread its wings to dry them and warm them after the night. But it doesn't have enough energy yet to fly away. And that's when you take your picture. Because if you ever try to take pictures of butterflies, as soon as you get into focus, before you can click the shutter, it's gone. <laughs> it's very hard to take pictures of butterflies. But that's one way to do it if you put in the energy and the time to track things down. Okay? So that, that's just a tip if you want to do some photography. Anything else? Well, thank you all for coming. I appreciate your attention. And like I say, there's a lot of good books on this stuff out there. Do some research, and um, I'm sure you'll come up and, and have lots of birds and lots of butterflies and other good things in your yards. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.